Great. So I am really delighted to uh, introduce our first speaker, our first speaker in our webinar this afternoon. Um, and I will just bring her up on screen now alongside me. Um, and this is uh, Regina Deegan. So Regina is the assistant principal in the local government structures and modernization section of the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. Um, and has worked closely with colleagues in, in the Department of Rural and Community Development in drafting a new set of LECP guidelines. So, uh, and I have had the joy of working with Regina on preparing this webinar, so it's great to, to introduce you now, Regina. And your presentation is going to cover particularly the economic elements of the LECPs and really provide us with an overview of what we're going to be doing today. So with that, Thanks. Regina, I'll invite you to get your slides up and ready and uh, yeah. look forward to hearing from you. Okay, I'm just going to um, share my slides there now, Ali. Um, can you see them? Yeah, and I'll just let you know once they're up in the, the full slideshow view. And just one more click just to get it into the, if you could, it's in the black view at the moment, just to get it. Oh, into okay. The, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay. You can see perfect there, yeah? We can see that perfectly. Thanks a lot. Great. Richard. Okay, so good, good afternoon everyone and thank you very much for your time today. Um, I'm going to quickly run through um, the economic elements of the LECPs and I'll just give you a, an idea of what's on today's agenda. So firstly, I just want to touch on an extract from the Local Government uh, Reform Act uh, 2014. It's section 43 and it enables local authorities to undertake activities that promote the general development of their communities including an enterprise and economic development. Section 44 of the Act then sets out the requirements of your local economic and community plans. So your LECPs are the primary mechanism to set out uh, your local authorities' plan to promote the interests um, of the community and achieve economic and community development objectives for your local authority area. So your LECP then will set out for a six year period these objectives that are needed to promote and support the economic and community development of your area. I suppose this is to be done both by the local authority directly and in partnership with other stakeholders. After feedback received on the previous cycle, um, it was decided that we take a new approach to the LECP process this time around to ensure more flexible and agile plans that can allow for emerging needs on an ongoing basis. So this may be achieved by creating an overall framework which details your high level goals and sustainable development objectives over the six years of the plan. And this is then followed by implementation plans for shorter time periods, which allow for new or changing circumstances to be taken into account in an ongoing way. The initial implementation plan should be presented for approval along with your overall LECP framework. So the existing plans all came to an end in 2021. So now most local authorities are working through the development stages of the next cycle of the LECPs. So the guidelines that were published last November should give you a good steer on how to go about drafting inclusive and wide ranging plans. We've also had a number of training webinars to help get you started with drafting your plans. And after today's session, we'll have a couple more training events to come and I'll provide the details of these a little later on. So as I mentioned, section 44 of the Act also sets out the economic areas which local authorities must have regard for in preparing your plans. However, the guideline summarizes these main features of supporting economic development under six economic action areas that are listed here. So each of these action areas brings into focus a particular set of activities that when put in place and supported will contribute to the economic progress in your local authority area. Some examples of high level objectives that will support economic development under these action areas are listed here in very general terms. So you will see that these ob objectives include attracting investment, growing employment, digital infrastructure, urban and rural regeneration and climate action, just to name a few. So these are very overarching objectives and they will require extensive engagement with your stakeholders in order to have the appropriate structures in place to bring about the required actions to achieve these goals. It's also worth noting that expertise in economic development will most likely be obtained from within your lo own local authorities experience 
or from within your partner organizations. So this brings me on to identifying some, but not all of the principal organizations that can have a role in local economic development. Depending on a particular local authority area, some of these organizations may be more relevant. However, we invite you to consult with your organizations at the earliest development stage of your LECP in order that you can create the necessary links to support the actions that are required by your plans. It's also worth mentioning that local authorities cannot effectively perform their economic development function in isolation from each other. And it's important that you take into account regional factors when preparing your LECP. Therefore, it's necessary to engage with your regional assembly in the development of your plan, as it has to be consistent with both the regional, spatial and economic strategies and the regional enterprise plans for your area. And we'll be hearing in more detail on both of these key structures later on today. Some of the key government, economic and enterprise strategies that could also be utilized by the LECP process are listed here. And a more comprehensive list is provided in Appendix 6 of the guidelines. We'll also be hearing from some of these important policy areas today, and they will highlight some of the opportunities that could be incorporated into the economic development objectives of your LECPs. So as I mentioned earlier, we've already hosted a number of training events for local authorities to date, and have also held an interdepartmental training event to help raise the awareness of LECPs among other government departments. The RCD will also be hosting a national event on the engagement of marginalized communities on Wednesday, the 4th of May. And we also have very tentative dates at the moment for our training webinars on climate action and community development. And we'll be in touch with you shortly to firm up these dates once we have confirmed. So as you will see from today's agenda, we have a fairly full afternoon planned and we'll be hearing from speakers from a wide variety of areas that can impact the economic elements of your LECPs. Of course, there will also be benefits from some of these policy areas to the community development side of your plans, because while we're focusing on the economic elements of LECPs today, both sides of the plans are fundamentally linked to each other. So while we try to separate the elements of an LECP, you may find that there are a number of areas of overlap today, as your plans will always be integrated and therefore it's, you will find it's important that there is ongoing collaboration on both sides at all stages of the LECP process. So thank you all again for your time today. And if you have any, if you think of any questions after today or comments or feedback you'd like to give us, please feel free to send an email to LCDC support at dcrd.gov.ie. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Regina. I'll just uh, stop your sharing there. Yeah. And yeah, thanks for all of that and for giving us an overview of what is to come in a, a rich afternoon this afternoon. So I will move on with that and uh, move into introducing our next speaker. So our next speaker is Colm Ford. Let me just find you here on screen, Colm. There we are. Yeah, so Colm is Principal Officer in the Regional Enterprise Plans and Initiatives Unit of the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment. And Colm, I know that you are gonna be providing an overview of the regional enterprise plans and focusing on their importance in developing our LECPs. So thank you very much, Colm, and over to you. Thank you very much, Ali. I'm just getting my presentation ready and hopefully share my screen. So just give me a moment. Yeah, that's great. We can see yeah. that clearly. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, that perfect. I just need to... Okay, perfect. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. And um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I really enjoyed that, that first presentation because I see so much alignment with our regional enterprise plans. So firstly, for those of you who are not overly familiar with what regional enterprise plans are, they emanated out of what you may remember as being the action plan for jobs, which was an initiative by government. when we had the economic downturn around the you know, 2007, 2008. And that was a very heavily action-based uh, program with hundreds of actions designed to try and help uh, reduce unemployment throughout the country. But I guess it was quite micro in nature. And after a few years, the consideration was that we should benefit from kind of bringing it up a level to be more strategic in nature. And that's ultimately where regional enterprise plans came to. So these are 
bottom up initiatives um, brought from the region. They are not uh, top down, so they're not dictated by central government. And um, it's, it's a really valuable initiative that I know is very much politically supported. So we have the country split into nine uh, regions, which is broadly aligned with the NUTS three uh, categorization. So we have the Northwest, West, Midwest, Southwest, Southeast, Mideast, Midlands, Dublin, and the Northeast. And we have just launched new regional enterprise plans up to 2024 um, in the first couple of months of this year. And we actually just launched the last one yesterday in Clorglin. We had been aiming to have all of them launched uh, in Q1, but unfortunately COVID resulted in, in yesterday's launch in Clorglin um, being, being delayed for a little while. But I saw a few familiar names there on, on the list today who I've met throughout the country over the last couple of months. And we work really well with the local authorities and with our partner uh, government departments because it is all about that collaboration when it comes to regional enterprise plans. Um, so my role within the department is in a regional enterprise plans and initiative unit. There are uh, eight of us in the team and we support the nine regional steering committees throughout the country. And we engage with enterprise agencies, with other central government departments and across our own team and Enterprise Ireland's and IDA to make sure that that regional aspect is reflected in, in national policy. So the, the whole purpose of regional enterprise plans is to facilitate regional stakeholders to work collaboratively to identify opportunities, recognize vulnerabilities, and strengthen the regional enterprise ecosystem to enable job creation. And the, the little graph there I have in the corner shows that key interlinkage we see between government, both at central and local level, academia through our higher education institutes, and I guess a particular, um, particular uh, strong point that we see for the latest uh, edition of regional enterprise plans is the advent of our new technological universities, which I know are very warmly welcomed throughout the country in our regions, and they see them as really adding to the competitiveness of the regions. Also, we're Colin, very keen on engaging with Indo. Colin, Apologies. sorry, just, just a little note, just to say that um, in, in case you've moved on a slide, it's not showing at the moment. It's oh, still just on the title apologies. slide, just because we're probably dying to see them. So, Apologies, I am, um, where yes. am I? Yeah. Okay, I'll, otherwise let me know if I can help, but uh, great. Sorry, that's where I am. Apologies for that. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Um, so sorry, yeah, this, this is the graph I was referring to, which obviously no one could see. So there you go. Uh, it's government, academia, industry and community. And um, I know we're careful about lingo. All of our jobs have lingo. But one of the first things I heard in this job was the importance of the quadruple helix model. And so this is the quadruple helix model, that interaction between government, academia, industry and community. And we find when we bring all of those four elements together, we really do have a more strengthened enterprise plan for each region. And um, so the, throughout 2021, we had an extensive consultation period, which I'm sure many of you would have engaged with within your regions to try and make sure that each regional enterprise plan was as strong as it could be and take account of both the strengths and opportunities within each uh, region. So I have here just a couple of pictures from the, the various launches. Our first launch was in Nina and Tipperary, representing the Midwest area, and the Taunashta launched that in February, along with Minister English and Minister Troy. We then had the Northeast launch in the Cavan Digital Hub, which is an amazing facility uh, with Minister Humphreys and Minister English. And then uh, in the Midlands, uh, we were in Mullingar and the IMR, which is again, amazing research facility, bringing that real application into industry uh, with Minister Troy. And for anyone who hasn't been in the RDI Hub in Kalorglin, where we were yesterday, I would uh, encourage anyone to visit it. It's an amazing facility um, to the benefit of that uh, Southwest region. Um, so the main principles that we consider uh, when we talk about regional enterprise plans, we looked for place-based um, place based initiatives that complement national policy and make it more imp impactful within that regional context. So when we talk about place-based, for example, when we look at Limerick, they recognise that they have a number of the key, uh, a number of the major economic unemployment black spots in the country. So there are a number of social enterprise initiatives there having hubs in um, socioeconomic deprived areas, helping build that pathway from unemployment back to work. And that's been very successful. Um, from the bottom up perspective, we look for initiatives from the region, as I mentioned earlier, and not from central government. So that collaboration between our local authorities, higher education uh, institutes um, and industry is really important. This word additional, sometimes uh, I prefer the word complementary because people when they see additional means maybe it can't be any way related to maybe 
existing initiatives from central government, from our state agencies or local authorities. But I think we can just build out or, or complement what's, what's already there. I think that's really important. Like, so for example, we in, in Wicklow, there's a, a, a strategy for screen content creation. And you know, people would know that Wicklow is particularly strong in that area. And I know um, from the earlier presentation, we, we kind of referenced that importance of action oriented. So we all like to have our smart actions that are specific, measurable, time bound. And so when we speak to 2024, we're looking for these actions to be implemented throughout the regional um, enterprise plans. Let's go to the next slide. Um, also, Regina mentioned that alignment with national policy. And again, that's key to us. So regional enterprise plans are aligned with Enterprise 2025 Renewed, which is our kind of major um, policy within the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment. And you may have heard recently, the department has gotten clearance from Cabinet to develop a new white paper on enterprise strategy. And a key focus of that will be that regional aspect that we're making sure that the regions are competitive, and that our job growth is not just concentrated on our major, major urban centres, that there is opportunities in, in every corner of Ireland. The program for government is very clear on this about adopting a coherent policy approach to the enterprise needs in every part of Ireland. And you'll, you'll be aware of that from the various political announcements. That they're always focusing on the number of jobs created outside of Dublin or outside of our major, major urban centres. And that's a critical element of the regional enterprise plans. And of course, then from the planning perspective, this all takes place in the context of the national planning framework and through the statutory elements that were mentioned earlier with the regional, spatial and economic strategies, and then aligned with the local authority, county and city development plans. And we see the real strength of the regional piece being that it enables local authorities to think across borders. So one of the areas we see this being particularly beneficial, you know, there's a lot of focus on enterprise hubs at the moment and remote working hubs. And I think we have a, a critical mass now, which is obviously being managed centrally through the Department of Rural Community Development and the Western Development Commission, that we have a more holistic view of, of how those hubs are best utilised, where they are in the country, that the occupancy rate is there, and that we have, we understand clearly what services and offerings each hub provides. So from a Department of Enterprise perspective, we're more focused on what we kind of uh, coin as enterprise hubs, hubs that can be used for startups, for scaling businesses and that's provide kind of support services around mentoring or financial management so we're really kind of focusing on developing a business as opposed to you know somebody going into to co-work that, that the, the focus of the of these regional enterprise plans from going through the um, specific elements of the local economic community plans you know there's a couple of areas that specifically um emanate uh, specifically reflected with us from the regional enterprise plan perspective and in terms of forming the economic plan and advising on economic components of the community elements in the LECP, we think that there's room there for plenty of engagement with the regional assemblies and regional enterprise plans through the steering committees to make sure that the LECP takes full account of regional considerations. The jobs and, and labour market activation, again, is a central focus of regional enterprise plans that we can provide sustainable, um, good value employment in all parts of the country. Um, and, and the economic area six, that future specific economic development to action in line with regional priorities. And again, if we look at different parts of the country in our regional enterprise plans, they do speak to those regional opportunities. So for example, in Donegal, we have a, a marine cluster up in Killy Beggs, which takes advantage of the inherent advantages they have there. We have a joint project between the Northwest, Midwest and Southwest on the potential for offshore wind energy. Um, in the Mideast, they're looking at opportunities in the equine industry. So you can see that each, um, each part of the country is looking at where its strengths are. And in the Southwest, again, they're looking at the benefits of agri-tech. So we would encourage each region to kind of think on a, on a broader basis about where their opportunities lie. And when I looked through today's agenda, looked through the various speakers, I thought it might be helpful to kind of highlight where regional enterprise plans align, because there is so much alignment between all of our activities. So when we look at town centre first, Minister Troy recently launched a new um, Edgewardstown co-works digital, digital hub. Um, and I think for those of you who are familiar with Edgewardstown, it was a town that maybe had suffered over the last couple of decades. But now this is an old uh, bank building that had been left vacant, which is now a hub of activity in the community and providing opportunity for people to work from. It's a real top class um, uh, asset to the area. In terms of digital strategies, some of you may be familiar with the Donegal, Donegal Digital, um, which is a very impressive initiative in Donegal. One of the areas that we are funding is called the Initial One Innovation Hub in Bunkrana. And again, that's allowing people to build and scale businesses multinationally, all from the far northwest of, of the island. 
Um, I know Porik is going to give a presentation to local enterprise offices later, and Porik is a key stakeholder within the Midwest Regional um, Enterprise Plan with a specific focus on startups. And one of the projects that he would have been centrally involved in is a future mobility campus in Shannon, which is aimed at automated driving and all the opportunities that provides in, in areas like drones. It's really cutting edge stuff. So um, Porik might reflect on that a bit later. In terms then of national social enterprise policy, again, that's very important from the regional enterprise plans perspective. I spoke earlier about the addressing the unemployment uh, black spots within Limerick, but there are also initiatives such as Spade and The Edge in Tala and the North Inner City in, in Dublin, which both aim to support um, you know, uh, areas that maybe aren't as economically vibrant as, as others. So one uh, in The Edge in Tala, that's helping again, an unemployment a black spot to have that bridge to employment gains and spade in the north inner city is a is providing kitchen facilities for startup food businesses that otherwise they may not be able to invest in the capital to access that kind of um, high level kitchen facilities whereas the funding provided through regional enterprise plans is providing for that the regional spatial and economic strategies is very much aligned with regional enterprise plans and our regional assemblies have now been given a critical role in being identified as the managing authorities for the european regional development fund in Ireland for 2021 to 2027. And that is an area where uh, the regional enterprise plans is gaining most of its funding for, for the next few years. So we have a very close working relationship with our uh, regional assemblies. In terms of governance, it may be of interest uh, for some of our colleagues here today. Um, each regional enterprise plan is, is overseen and developed by a regional steering committee. That um, all of those have an industry chairperson at the lead who's prominent within that area and it brings a, a gravitas to the plan. And then the local authorities would obviously be major stakeholders along with our higher education institutes uh, and other and our enterprise agencies. And really that builds that bridge between regional and national policy and helps to steer and report on the actions within the regional enterprise plan. And um, each of our nine steering committees are supported by designated program managers. And we see these as, as critical people in each region. I'm sure they work very closely with the local authorities and are co-funded by the local authorities in each region. Um, I, I took note there that the LECP guidelines recommend that the local authorities advisory steering group should also include members from the regional steering committee. And I think that alignment is incredibly valuable. Um, obviously, when we launch these uh, plans all around the country, the message from our stakeholders is, well, if we have the plan, where's the money to implement them? So that's a key political ask. And so we have now provided up to 180 million to help implement the plans there over the next couple of years. And I've already indicated that that money will be coming from the European Regional Development Fund. That builds on 126 million, which has already been provided for existing projects. Many, some that are finished and others that are still in the pipeline to be launched in the coming months and years. Those were not previously known as the Regional Enterprise Development Fund and the Border Enterprise Development Fund, along with the Regional Enterprise Transition Scheme. And then in light of I guess, challenges in construction costs over the last couple of years, an additional 12 million has been set aside to help finish off those projects that were previously sanctioned. And actually at the moment, there's a 5 million competitive priming scheme open from Enterprise Ireland, inviting applications. And I know many local authorities are already engaged in that process and hopefully will be submitting applications to that fund in the next couple of weeks. So look, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to address any further questions in the Q&A or equally if anyone would like to email me any queries, I'm happy to, to, to get back to you in due course. Great, thank you so much, Colm. Um, I'm really struck by how much is happening. Thank you for just sharing such a rich list of different examples and also making the connections with our other speakers and other presentations we're about to hear. So looking forward to moving on from there. Thank you very much. Um, so I will, in saying that, move swiftly on to our next speakers. So, and uh, yes, I can see you're, you're getting ready there already, Stuart. Let me bring you up onto the, the online stage as it were. So um, Stuart, Stuart Logan is a senior advisor in the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. And I know that before that you were a town planner, both in the UK, which I know quite well, and Ireland, um, uh, doing forward planning and development management roles and you lead on policy areas, which include the town center first policy uh, area, uh, which was launched in February, 2022. And I know that that um, is what you're going to be talking about today and how objectives from that can be incorporated into our LECPs. So thanks a lot, Stuart, and over to you. Listen, uh, th thanks. I hope you can hear me all, all okay there. And listen, um, 
afternoon to everyone and, and I appreciate taking the time just to, I suppose, look at some of these topics that are, I suppose, always very urgent when you come to something like this, but I, I know it, you know, you have a lot of other kind of different priorities. So it's good really to explore some of them in kind of detail. I think Colin and Regina have given an outline there. And I suppose what I want to do, I suppose, uh, colleagues and I recognize a couple of names just on the list or may have heard a bit about the Town Centre First policy. So today I just want to kind of go through that and maybe provide a bit of a relationship between that and I suppose the process of the LECP as well and how, how that might, uh, I, I suppose, affect or, or, or kind of steer towards a certain kind of approach. Um, first of all, I suppose just to say, like um, just in the background there, that we have a lot of towns in Ireland um, there's, and we're, we're kind of different to a lot of other kind of geographies or, or countries in that it can go from everything from, I suppose, what say designated in, I know Colin mentioned the national planning framework earlier, you know, the, the five kind of regional growth centers that you're Dundalk, Trotta, Athlone, and Sligo, Letterkenny, and um, they're all up around 20, 25,000, but there's lots of other towns there that are up of that order. There's the likes of Ennis, Tralee, Kilkenny, others that are, that are big towns. And then below that, again, you have the likes of Abbey Leaks, uh, or Ross Cray, Cove, Turles, you know, big enough kind of towns getting down to, you know, smaller ones like, like Bantry or Castle Blaney or that. And when you take them all together, and, and these would be figures you know, for population from the 2016 census, and it would have changed since, since then. But you know, you're looking at somewhere in the region of 500 towns in the country. So it's something that everybody kind of knows about. Everybody probably has an attachment to a town. Um, and they've seen over the last number of years how perhaps different, you know, what we're talking about today, particularly on the economic side, is impacted on the town. And, and, and certainly people are aware that, that there needs to be changed made. And I suppose that was one of the reasons for the, the provision of a town centre first policy, which was a, a commitment in government. And it's, it's taken a while, but uh, has been brought to fruition now. And um, just to go, I suppose that's that's the, the flavoured copy of the front cover of it there, but it was launched in February. It has 33 actions um, and importantly owners for those actions. Uh, and I'll go through a bit of that in, in, in subsequent slides, but it's really kind of that, that piece to ensure that it is uh, implemented through ownership and through the various kind of stakeholders, as we, as we always call them, you know, are involved in implementing uh, a policy. Um, particularly just to mention, I suppose, there are supports and, and, and measures that are at a local level within local communities, within the local authority primarily as well, uh, but also national structures, you know, in terms of national government but also uh, a, a national uh, office to try and uh, drive the policy um, and ensure that it is implemented again, just to make that point. Um, obviously aware that there's lots of good work going around the country uh, around kind of town development and regeneration, revitalization, and it's not to negate that or to subjugate it, but really building on that and, and perhaps building on experience and lessons learned there um, that others can, can kind of benefit from so that that kind of capacity building gets going. Um, and certainly, I suppose, a key one, and the years always prick up around this, is that there is focus uh, for funding around town centre first policy. So there's when the different aggregate parts are, are put together, um, there's a huge amount of funding available for the various aspects of town development. And really, town centre first, at its essence, is trying to make sure that they're all drawn together and, and I suppose that the community or the locality gets the, the best kind of bang for buck for that kind of state investment and it's, it's really kind of aggregated up to really have an impact locally. Um, then I suppose in summary, just to have a, a, a couple of the key features that, that might be of interest. Um, one, uh, firstly, I suppose, is this kind of vision thing. And I, I know that's sometimes labored, but it's really important that there is kind of a view and an analysis developed locally. And this is again, kind of building on very much the, the LECP type approach where you know, the locality, you know, and that's, I suppose, combines of not just residents, but local businesses, retail, you know, voluntary groups, they're, they're very aware of the local challenges and they really need to have a strong input in, into how uh, they're responded to, I suppose, initiatives or, or responses are, are formulated. Um, and really important that, that there's that community engagement and buy-in so that, as we know, un unless that's there, there's not really going to be much achieved that that's really important that that's very much kind of focused on. Uh, and they're brought in at a very early stage and build on local kind of knowledge, local experience, local attitudes uh, in, into a plan. And, and that can be sometimes championing um, in an individual, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It can be a group of individuals or um, a particular group. Um, 
uh, that really have a, a, a vested interest in their local community and, and are willing, I suppose, to, to put some of their time and energy into it. That's, that's really important as well. Uh, I, I suppose the more kind of hard-nosed element is that there'll be lots of intentions, lots of good intentions, um, but there has to be some kind of consideration of what's really got to be prioritised there. Um, and then what's the best kind of um, ones are supposed to select for, I suppose, implementation or looking to implement and what the, the risks and opportunities that are available uh, locally, because I think deliverability is, is a key element because people are only really going to see change if they can, um, you know, experience it, you know, if they go down and, and, and they experience their town or their town has changed uh, visibly in front of them, that that's, you know, when that that, that that's seen by them, then they'll really, you know, know that the, the policy has been implemented and that there'd be some kind of um, fitness test for it. My slides seem to have gone a bit awry here, so I'll try and uh, maybe get back on track. I'll give you a preview of the only other ones now. But, uh, sorry, yeah, just back on track there. So just to call about four, I suppose, key um, kind of takeaways from the policy. Um, I suppose these are ones that you probably come across maybe. One is, um, with our colleagues in DRCD, which we jointly uh, prepared the policy with. Um, there will be a funding for a town regeneration officer uh, at a fairly senior level within local authorities to really take the, the policy and implement it locally, not uh, operate in isolation, but very working with you know, existing teams within the local authority, uh, technical administrative teams, um, in, in, in working through the policy uh, locally and putting it into projects and delivery. Um, and I suppose secondly, that at a national level, there will be uh, a town centre national office um, headed by uh, a national coordinator um, housed in the LGMA that will be very much working with those 25, 26 um, town regeneration officers um, to coordinate their work, provide them with you know, resources, uh, working on best practice networking, that, that dissemination that I mentioned earlier, uh, and really working for, for two kids and other resources and um, so that it, it's, it's really done in a coordinated kind of fashion, because a lot of the time, perhaps sometimes policy isn't connected at a national or local level. And that's that's a lesson learned and something that will be focused on specifically on terms of first. Um, another kind of national piece will be a national oversight group, which is really, I suppose, the, the agencies and the national kind of government level come together to make sure um, that, that there's a monitoring on the policy and that interventions are made if it's not or improvements or changes are made to the policy. Um, both in both implementation, but also in funding and support and policy, uh, if that is necessary, that, that group would be set up um, uh, in, in interaction with the national office. Um, lastly, then, just a um, uh, town centre first plan, and I, I know there's a lot of plans that local authorities have to prepare, but uh, just to describe, I suppose, the town centre first plan, it's really getting to what might be in a, an LECP or in a development plan, for instance, um, that has a particular initiative or action or operation side, you know, moving from, I suppose, maybe something that's been researched and agreed upon and into the, like, the delivery and the implementation phase and, and primarily the funding application state as well. So that can move again, uh, as Colin made the point there, where there's a policy uh, into funding and implementation and, and actual achievement of, of, of um, resources, but also capital kind of works locally. That's, that's that, you know, people will we'll see the change materialize in. Uh, this is really just kind of stepping out that, so roughly around the structure, I suppose, um, is the national office or the oversight group um, at an advisory level. Um, but that beneath that sits the national town center first off with a coordinator um, with a, a small team to provide resources uh, to, to work with those town regeneration officers within the local authorities. Um, they'll coordinate both internally within the local authority but also very much with local town teams. Um, and there it's like the local residents, uh, business leaders, community and voluntary groups, um, working with them on developing their local town center first plan um, and other initiatives. I'm probably building on a lot of capacity that's there at the moment, uh, but certain places you know, haven't been able to get that and there will be support to make sure that those town teams are established in, in most of the towns over obviously on a phased basis. Then I suppose maybe just bring it back to, to the LECPs themselves we're talking about, and I suppose the, the guidelines you'd be familiar with that were, were brought, brought um, uh, to publication last year. Uh, and it's really, I suppose, within the, the guidelines that are, as, as um, Regina mentioned earlier, there's a number of kind of national policy kind of pieces pushing onto that. And I suppose Town Centre First now is one of those that's kind of up front and centre that 
has been adopted by government and is across government policy and um, that would need to be kind of infused or, or brought into the, the, the LECP, particularly on the economic side, but not necessarily, you know, there are community elements to it too. Um, it's, it's not something, I suppose, that, you know, came out of the blue. It does build on, I suppose, other kind of national policy kind of priorities like uh, compact growth um, you know, trying to provide new development, be it housing, commercial, whatever, in towns, in settlements, as we like to call them, where there are existing resources and infrastructures that can be built on and, and provide best use of those. And um, really, it does kind of, again, chime with um, our climate agenda, having people, businesses, you know, a focus of activity within towns where people can have existing services close to them, you know, reduce their carbon footprint, they can walk and cycle, all that kind of good stuff, you know, really does uh, chime with the town centre first priority for the town um, agenda, um, particularly, I suppose, in, in, I suppose in, in areas where those towns provide a strong focus for their local rural community, you know, it's very much a hinterland with the services, you know, and, and the heart of the community maybe, that's quite a large geographical area, but it, it's really centred within the town. Uh, and there's lots of programmes with my own department and DRCD about trying to, to foster and to um, develop that. And Town Centre First kind of brings a lot of that together. Um, the world, there is obviously the, the statutory piece and the regional spatial economic strategies and the development plan kind of policies and settlement plan policies um, that, that are there. And I think Kevin will probably maybe talk to those later. But, so that, that's really a strong kind of piece, again, that is kind of coming into LECP through TCF, but something that you'll probably be very well aware of already. Um, the secondly, then, I suppose, just to re-emphasize that the town is very much now a cross-departmental piece where it is the center for investment, um, you know, the location for physical, economic and economic change. Um, and that needs to be focused on that kind of placemaking piece that has been mentioned earlier. But it is to be community-led. Um, and that type of engagement and, and solution focused um, uh, dynamic locally um, is really you know, the heart of, of town centre first, as it is with most I suppose, process where the local authority is really facilitating and giving kind of um, support to, I suppose, the ambitions and the I suppose, intentions of the local community. And the, la the last piece there just to draw out in, in terms of bringing the town centre first into the LECP is really there's a huge amount of funding available for this. I'll go into that in detail in the next slide, but there's quite a, a, um, an open door there pushed for when um, certain types of um, funding are being applied for. Um, but there is an onus now, particularly in, in terms of when those applications are going to, to demonstrate alignment with the types of um, policy precepts that are in town centre first, um, that there is a consideration of that in the application. So it's not being in isolation, it's, it's taking that on board when I suppose an application for funding is being made. Um, really, this slide, I just want to maybe touch on some of the opportunities there that are there and that might be kind of considered or maybe developed in preparing LECPs. And again, just to refer back to both the climate change and that adaption, you know, within the town or within the built fabric, there's you know, a, a quite an, an important piece there to look at, does what can be done locally in terms of initiatives and operational pieces you know, in the economic sphere or that, that might assist in, I suppose, those kind of, I suppose, intentions that we were all familiar with around carbon reduction, you know, getting them, you know, sustainable forms of transport, all that kind of stuff and how that can be done within the town. And um, also housing is obviously a key kind of government priority, but the town really allows it maybe for smaller households, maybe you have people with less mobility, different stages, you know, in, you know, there will always be a need for family housing, but there's also households that maybe want to or have a greater need for, maybe don't have the same size of unit kind of demand and they can be accommodated more in the town where the, you know, there's other activities in terms of employment and recreation might be available. Um, also just, in, you know, there's a huge amount of investment going into pub and ground and streets. And I think we've really been aware of that probably over the last kind of year or two in COVID that we're just coming out of now and we see the animation and you know, people congregate you know, in, in, in towns um, you know, for, for, for social reasons, for entertainment, for, you know, interaction with others, basically, you know, this is a real opportunity to try and uh, build on that. Um, and many towns have kind of built on that through, you know, the likes of cultural and heritage, you know, assets. I mean, that I mean, you know, 
um, kind of attractions that may uh, entice people into the town and, and keep them there in economic sense um, uh, to, to, to spend, but also for you know, visitors um, from outside, but also residents you know, to, to have that kind of local pride kind of given uh, a full support. Um, as well as those natural amenities here, you're talking about greenways, blueways, and um, park you know, development, those types of active recreation stuff that can be better accommodated in towns and then people have maybe greater active um, kind of input or access to uh, when, when they're there as opposed to perhaps more, more you know, um, in the countryside type of uh, arrangements where it's perhaps more difficult to access those. Uh, just coming to an end here, but really, I suppose, just to emphasize again um, that, that, that the wealth, and I do mean wealth there, I mean, I would have worked for, for many years in local authorities where there was very limited um, funding available, and, and there's certainly a huge amount now, and it just listed some of them here. I mean, if you take the, the URDF operated by ourselves and the Rural Fund operated by DRC, I mean, that's, that's okay, it's over a decade, but that's um, nearly, I thought, between the towns and cities, nearly 3 billion euro, and, and certainly at the moment it's about, Six, uh, 650 million committed to investment in towns across lots of different kind of projects. Uh, and there will be further calls for, for that um, on, on a town centre first thematic level. But there is, I suppose, um, funding there again, when done in the right way and with the right um, uh, kind of emphasis put on uh, town centre first to access that. And certainly, you know, within tradi more traditional programmes like the social housing capital programme, that's again been focused on within towns where possible. Um, other kind of cross-border funding, you know, for, for towns, you know, you know, within that kind of uh, remit, uh, lots of walking, cycling and um, kind of programs to increase that infrastructure. And um, obviously there's, there's huge assets there in terms of the built, built heritage and particular funding streams around that. Uh, and also in preparation for specific towns that are first uh, funding around a particular issue of vacant buildings and, and dereliction program uh, buildings within uh, towns that we're going to focus on in terms of some kind of funding. So if you take that all together, um, and, and just to come to a summary on, on the piece of town centre first, really, um, there is now clear priority from government and, ac and across government for, for towns and, and their role in terms of policy, be that it developed nationally or even locally with the development plan, the statutory development plan or, or the LACP statutory as well. Uh, and it's real focus for investment and investment decisions and programs. Uh, and that's, that's operated both at a national level and at a local level with structures being and personnel indeed being put in place to support those. Um, and there should be, I know, we're looking at, I suppose your LACP and integration, you know, and the guidelines I and mean, the, the LACP guidelines kind of emphasize that, that there should be an integration between, between your LACP and your development plan and, and the town center first. So when, those, there's a strong kind of research and agreed basis for that within the local authority and indeed in the community. So when you do get to, I suppose, putting together those types of projects, they are very much integrated around the place, around the, the town itself or the, or, or the wider geographic kind of locality that there's a firm basis and here it is in our LCP and this is why we're applying for funding for it. And these are the reasons for it. And this is the track record that we're going to put into that delivery space uh, and that's just a, a really important piece just to, to note, because I know a lot of plans um, and the point is made, you know, struggle about getting those and, and the struggle previously was in relation to funding, but certainly now there's a great um, funding uh, wealth there to access and the more consistent and more integrated your LECP is with other kind of elements in the local authority and that is happening locally, the greater or a better chance you stand of being successful in those um, project be it, you know, to my own department or other departments, it will certainly be a, an increasing focus. So uh, that's all I, I have to say, Ali. Look, I'm happy to take uh, questions at the end or if you want to filter them back through to Regina, you know, separately, but um, hopefully that's given a, a flavor for the policy. Thanks, thanks very much. Perfect, thanks so much, Stuart. Wow, it really uh, kind of brings forth the importance of the Town Centre First policy, particularly for all these many towns we have. And I really get the message of the funding available and the need for integration. And in a way, partly that's what this session today is doing is, is weaving all those connections and we'll continue doing that. So yeah, we'll, if we could, we're gonna to move to our next speaker in this section and then we'll do a short Q and A. So I think there might be questions for you, Stuart. I saw one in the chat already. So I'll come back to you at that point. Um, so before we do that, there, I'm going to now introduce our next speaker and uh, let me find you there, Pamela.
Here we are. Yes, so just uh, really delighted to introduce Pamela Pender, who is a senior executive officer in the Roads, Transportation and Public Safety Directorate of Kildare County Council. And I know you have uh, 20 years of experience in local government and are currently the Broadband Liaison Officer in Kildare, um, working with the Broadband Officer, and you're developing this uh, digital strategy for, for Kildare, which is, I believe, what you're going to be telling us about, and we are dying to hear. So, yeah, if you want to, yeah, great, click into slideshow, and I will hand over to you, Pamela. Thanks a million, and thank you to, to everybody uh, and for the invitation today. And um, so... For, for me today, I'd like us to talk about the digital strategy and uh, it's currently in, in, its, in its final stage in Kildare and we've just finished our public consultation and stakeholder engagement period. So we're looking forward to, this will be our first strategy in Kildare and we're looking forward to bringing it uh, across the line. So our, um, our, our framework, we have five strategic pillars uh, which form the framework for our digital strategy. So we have digital economy, uh, digital infrastructure, digital skills, digital society, and digital services. And I'll just uh, go into some of the areas of focus for each of those. Um, the, for digital economy, e-commerce, e digital marketing and media, uh, IT systems, cloud, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, we're all aware of the security incident with the HSE and the importance of having the proper cybersecurity measures in place, but also having our staff trained to identify the potential risks is, is crucial. Uh, SME digitalization, start, uh, tech startups and digital clusters, remote working and digital hubs have seen demand escalate during, uh, during and post pandemic. The digital infrastructure and connectivity element, uh, we look towards our national, national broadband plan and the delivery of high speed internet uh, to those in the intervention area. So for Kildare, that will see the plan pass and connect 15,000 premises. So it's not a large amount compared to many counties on the western seaboard, but Kildare enjoys a very rural urban mix and the south and northwest of Kildare would be considered very rural. Our broadband officer is engaging with county development plan process, which is currently under review in Kildare to ensure that uh, objectives are included in the plan to provide for telecoms, ducting and masts to provide that connectivity. For digital skills, our third pillar, uh, we look to digital literacy as the bedrock for lifelong learning. Beyond knowing how to read and write, digital literacy means knowing how to use digital tools to express ideas to reach a wider audience. So digital skills are broadly defined as the skills needed to use digital devices, uh, communication applications and networks to access and manage information. So Vodafone and Active Ireland, Active Retirement Ireland are, are currently running a joint venture in BCPs, which are broadband connection points across the country to deliver a, a digital skills platform called High Digital, designed specifically for older people. Uh, devices and training is provided and it includes a guide on how the internet can help enhance our everyday lives. And it also includes smartphone basics, how to connect with others, entertainment and shopping online, hobbies and travel. So COVID-19, you know, some many business owners use social media platforms promoting online trading and like many other businesses and organizations, virtual communication has quickly evolved and it looks like it's here to stay. Time savings, uh, reduced traffic congestion, uh, which in turn reduces our CO2 emissions are just some of the benefits. And for some businesses that might also mean upskilling, reskilling or specializing. Pillar four then is our digital society and we look at smart community initiatives. The, as I mentioned, West Kildare has been hugely impacted by recent government policy to cease industrial peat extraction. Uh, the Board of Mona headquarters is based in Newbridge and it's an area synonymous with the industry. The loss of employment, livelihoods and community identity because of this shift encouraged our elected members to come together and develop a just transition plan for the area. The guiding priorities for the plan, which aligns with the objectives of the current LECP, have been to stimulate skills development and employment, build community cohesion and increase community resilience. The economic profile for West Kildare shows it has a higher proportion of its residents at work than, at than the national average, but it also shows it has a higher rate of unemployment. And while it has a higher proportion of skilled jobs than the national average, it also has a higher share of unskilled jobs. And while it has a higher share of residents educated to third level or higher, it also has a higher proportion with no formal education. So in particular, the south and west of the area 
experiences low employment and skills. And it is these more disadvantaged areas that need greater efforts to get more people into employment by creating more local and high skill jobs and upskilling the local population and workforce. So while County Kildare is home to a thriving and vibrant economically, economy, inequality remains a key issue with the highest areas of unemployment and deprivation located in West Kildare. So County Kildare Leader Partnership has commenced a smart village training for Northwest Kildare to help communities shape their own future, developing a plan for a vibrant community to live and work. The citizen participation aims to improve our policies and services. And in Kildare, we've introduced the consultation portal on our website, which allows uh, the, the public to make online submissions to projects that uh, we have uh, put out to public consultation. Some of those are statutory and some are non-statutory. The online safety and internet security, that's an element of our digital society pillar, but it is also an intrinsic part of our digital skills and digital economy pillars. Whether we're introducing our citizens to the internet, our training and upskilling staff, the importance of safety online cannot be underestimated. Culture, arts and heritage development and tourism. For visitors to the county, we have a very informative website, uh, intokildare.ie. Our fifth and final pillar then is their digital services. And, and, and the focus here is on e-government and digitalization and e-service delivery. E-government strategies and the development of the public service ICT strategy will use digital and ICT to improve citizen and business access to and interaction with government services. Kildare County Council has introduced e-invoicing into its financial management system, streamlining our payment, payment processes and providing a better experience to our suppliers. E-planning is currently being rolled out across the sector. The open data portal, um, the legislation is in place and open data officers have been um, put in place in, across the local authority uh, sector to promote innovation and transparency through the publication of Irish public sector data in open, free and reusable formats. It is also considered that the availability of these data sets will reduce the number of FOI requests. Kildare County Council will also look at our own internal system uh, integration, eliminating barriers and to ensure success with digital transformation. The aim will be to deliver services digital, digitally as the preferred option through a single contact point or a one-stop shop and via different channels. We will still keep other channels open for those who are disconnected by choice or necessity. And we will explore assisted digital for those who feel they would benefit from such a service. And we would see using our libraries and customer service points for that facility. Cloud-based training uh, for staff that is, is used for staff in Kildare County Council and it's planned, uh, a planned expansion of that, that platform is, um, is recommended. It gives staff the opportunity to complete the training at their workstation through an online portal. And it, it's, it can be done at a time that suits and fits into their, their, their work schedule. So this is just some of the policies that we had to, uh, and we referred to when we were drafting our strategy document. Uh, I won't go through them all, but they are relevant to the five pillars of our framework. So the national digital strategy, Harnessing Digital has been recently published and came at a good time for us as we were entering into our, into our, our um, development phase. Uh, connecting Government 2030 and digital ICT strategy for public service refers to e-government and providing online connections to our gov government services. The National Broadband Plan uh, 2019 to 2027, that aims to deliver high-speed broadband to those identified in the intervention areas across the, count the country by 2027, and NBI are the lead on this project. The digitalization of SMEs in Ireland, DET 2019, uh, I'll, talk this, I'll talk about this um, later on in, in one of my other slides, and then the Kildare LECP, the current um, document, and then our new document, which will cover the period 2022 to 2027. Uh, our recently published Kildare 2025 Economic Strategy and Kildare Enterprise Plan 2024, and then our Kildare Hub Strategy, uh, just due to be published in quarter two of this year, the strategy focuses on hub development and investment and identifies all the hubs in County Kildare, including our three broadband connection points. So some of the key trends in emerging technology and digital. Um, the consumer demands and power consumption, the whole topic of data centers has emerged in the last year and their impact on the national grid. An IDA report lists a number of reasons why the country is an attractive spot for the centers to be built. 
In 2021, there were 70 operational data, data centres in Ireland, with Dublin the largest data centre hub in Europe. So Ireland's skilled workforce, our climate, the advanced infrastructure, our low tax rate and renewable energy sources are all cited in the report as some attractive features. Other reports suggest it is the retention of Instagram, Instagram stories, TikTok videos and other social media elements stored uh, in these data centres that generates the greatest demand. Digital cash, the pandemic almost brought about a cashless society. Shops and supermarkets were card only, no cash accepted. And for many businesses and citizens, this has continued post pandemic by choice rather than regulation. So the pace of innovation requires the reskilling of employees. The digital ecosystems are emerging with a focus on developing digital platforms and industry specific technologies. Supply chain disruption experienced in the last two years has challenged organizations to reimagine their supply chains to build resiliency, sustainability, and an increased focus on security and data protection. And that is something that is, is a key feature, or we intend to, to have as a key feature of our digital strategy, is the importance on security and data protection of the businesses and the citizens that are using the service. There is increased competition with a growing technology startup ecosystem offering digital services and solutions. And in Kildare, we're very lucky to have our Merits uh, Technical Startup Hub, which offers um, a shared workspace, but it also offers a me mentoring and advice facility as well to those who attend. So this is our SWOT analysis, and there's a lot in it. I won't go through everything in it, but um, it, it was, this is a, a key feature of uh, the preparation of our, our, of our strategy document. So high level of KCC, digitalization of KCC services. Our libraries were to the forefront of the council during the pandemic and the e-services provided allowed our communities to access a large amount of digital content for education, work and entertainment. Events issued through virt virtual and interactive platforms included coding, biodiversity and even art classes. Consult.kildare, that again, as I mentioned, is our public consultation portal, and it was very much welcome during the pandemic and um, restrictions when we couldn't meet face to face. We were allowed to, it gave us an opportunity to continue with our public uh, consultation periods and our statutory processes and uh, create virtual rooms so that uh, th th there was no delay in, in service delivery. So there's a very strong relationship between Clare County Council and Maynooth University, which is home to a multidisciplinary applied research centre of excellence. The Innovation Value Institute, the IVI, was founded in collaboration with Intel and is focused on digital transformation and technology adoption. The centre works closely with Enterprise Ireland and IDA Ireland. The transport and communications infrastructure, uh, we think of our roads and rail networks that traverse the county and country, but we need to factor in the provision of ducting to those projects, ensuring our connectivity continues for citizens and business as technology changes. Extensive remote working. We have three broadband connection points in Kildare. We have one in the Lollymore Heritage Park. We have one in Crookstown and one in Big Stone, Castle Dermot. So uh, in terms of the county, we have one up north and we have two down, down south. In our opportunities section, uh, the smart communities training is underway in County Kildare Leader Company, and this refers to the just transition plan working with the people in West Kildare. The new LECP will, um, will support the delivery of the Kildare Digital Strategy, and we see the Kildare Digital Strategy document uh, is a few months ahead of the LECP plan, and in this regard, we think that the community and economic development area of our strategy will fit directly into the LECP plan. For our weaknesses outside of the lack of services referred to in earlier to earlier in West Kildare, there's very much a north-south divide in the county. North of the M7, we have Nace, Minute, Selbridge, Clayton, where demand for infrastructure and services is very high and a densely populated urban area. South of the county has greater dependency on the equine and farming industry. There isn't a greater demand for services, but the area is largely rural and forms a significant part for intervention area for the National Development Plan with evidence of poor connectivity in, in parts. For the threats, uh, our national global threats, uh, again, it's, it's if we were to go back down to um, um, public health restrictions or any future um, cyber attacks, digital poverty and digital exclusion. Again, that's about, you know, we don't want to leave anybody behind. We don't want to feel 
people to feel that they're marginally marginalized and, and isolated so not everybody will be happy to move online and they will still want to come in to the to the counter to to pay their motor tax or to pay their their parking ticket or whatever it may be and that service we intend to to, to remain for those people um and then local housing challenges and labor supply issues um are also a key threat so this is just an overview again of our of our five um our five pillars and the key digital projects and activities for, for digital economy, pillar one, we see the digitalization across the SME base, the Rethink, Re Redesign, IVI, that is an SME digital resource and support service that, that is available there. Again, our Merits Building and the Satellite Office for the Midwest, uh, the K-Hub Network Development for KCC and Leo, that's our, our K-Hub strategy. Uh, again, as I said, will, due to be published in Q2, Q3, 2022. Um, Sustainable Kildare and Kildare Chamber. Uh, Kildare Chamber are very supportive of the digital strategy and uh, have worked closely with us in, in making their submission. And then digital skills for the future and future workforce skills. So the dig digital agenda uh, for enterprise and economy and some of the key uh, industry focus uh, is on maximizing knowledge and technology and continuous digital learning, promote innovation across the enterprise base particularly among SMEs, support new industries and promote competitiveness, develop e-services and increase digitalization rates and ensure digital infrastructure and connectivity is serving all citizens, leverage knowledge and technology to enable sustainable urban change. The SME digitalization, um, there has been an extensive engagement, just bear with me now because whatever way the screen is set up, I. I I, some of my screen is blocked out with, with the video images. Um, there has been an extensive engagement with the business community around enterprise supports and the digital economy. Uh, Kildare Leo is a progressive partner in the delivery of the Mideast region enterprise plan, including projects such as Merits and Nace, as I've mentioned, and then a future a Thai food innovation hub. And then we also have an equine hub in the, um, the national stud in Kildare. So Kildare Chamber is providing leadership and knowledge around sustainable and green solutions for enterprise and promoting digital learning networks among its members. Manute University is a leading center for innovation, as I've mentioned, knowledge transfer and research and development support to industry, as well as a major source of science and technology graduates. Building digital clusters and sector networks will form much of the efforts over the coming years to help embed a culture of innovation and collaboration in the enterprise base, including FDI in a true digital ecosystem in Kildare. And then back to pillar one and, and the focus, which is our, our digital economy, the hubs and remote working piece, the Kildare Digital Strategy, together with the Kildare Hubs Network, KHubNet, will act as a key driver for the rapid development and accommodation of remote working, co-working and hub working. A number of startups and remote working hubs and tech enterprise networks are already established and more are at the planning stage. The KHub Network is collaborative is a collaborative project based on shared resources, knowledge, contacts, and experience to facilitate the hubs to serve their local communities in the enterprise and community development sphere and create a new model for work and livability across Kildare. So like my the previous speakers uh, have said, there is a lot of money available and um, some of the funding options through Enterprise Ireland, that's just an extract from their, their, their website there. So they provide funding and support for, for companies we have this, the, the Disruptive Technologies Innovation Fund, uh, and that's uh, the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment, and it's administered by Enterprise Ireland. So there's 500 million euro in funding there. And uh, that's just some examples I have given there of the disruptive technology. And that is currently available for call five and the closing date is in July this year. There's the Town and Village Renewal Scheme. There's the uh, Rural Regeneration Development Fund. There's the Urban Regeneration Development Fund and then Community Centres Investment Fund is also available. Um, the, for, for SME digitalization, there is a significant amount of money available through the EU funding schemes. And thank you. And again, I will take any questions either I, uh, through the chat or, or online. Wonderful. Thank you, Pamela. Oh, my goodness, I'm really struck at the end of your presentation and all of our presentations uh, in this first section have just 
this this term of the wealth of what's available, what's being done, what you work through with the different policies, this whole SWOT analysis, and the funding that is possible. So I think that's, uh, I hope that's been really helpful for everyone. And what I'll do, Pamela, is I'll just keep you up on screen and just turn back to uh, bring up all of our speakers in this uh, first section, starting with Regina, of course, who really overviewed the economic elements of the LECPs. Um, and then Colm, if I can find you here on my screen, or I might have to do this a different way. Oh, here we are, yeah. Um, so we have also the regional enterprise plans, and then with Stuart, it was town centre first. Um, and I think that was, yeah, that's all of us in the section. So just a moment to take a breath to reflect on what we've just heard, notice what was coming up for you, what might be of um, particular spark questions or really connected for you in your own work of developing your LECP. And we, you know, there's not lots of time for this, but I think it would be nice to just have a moment to see if there are questions and connect in that way. And then we'll move on and we'll, we'll be refreshed and ready to sort of listen to the next set of presentations that are to come. So yeah, just a reminder there that you can click on the reaction button and then raise hand button if you, and it'd be great to just hear a couple of questions. And in saying that, I am going to pause our recording until we move into our next set of presentations. Great, so I'm glad to be moving into our second set of presentations now. And I am delighted to introduce our next speaker. And in fact, saying that, let me just, uh, find you on, on screen for it. So uh, I think I'll have to do that this way. Here we are, where are you? Well, I can see you're there because uh, the slides are coming up now. There we are, I think I have you up there. So yes, Porik McElwee, uh, it's great to, to meet you as we prepared for this webinar. Porik is the chair of the network of local enterprise offices and head of enterprise with the LEO in Clare. And you have over 34 years experience uh, in financial services in, in particular. And I know that you're going to be looking at um, supporting local enterprises to underpin a vibrant local economy and cre create sustainable employment. So uh, really looking forward to hearing about that. And thank you, Porik. Over to you. Thanks very much, Ali. And good afternoon, everybody. You can hear me OK, Ali? Yeah? Yeah, hear you very good. clearly. Thanks. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. OK, first technical hitch. Didn't move forward, but anyway. Uh, just to give you a brief overview for those of you who are maybe not familiar with the local enterprise office, um, there's 31 of us, so we're represented in every local authority in the country. Um, our primary goal is nurturing enterprise culture. We're a first stop shop for early stage startups, so uh, either we help you directly or if we can't help a business up and running, we signpost them to where they can get support. Our focus is very much on economic growth within our each of our local authority of areas. Our obviously obvious target is job creation, because that's really how we measure the success of what we do. We have a very specific focus on internationally traded services and manufacturing. Uh, our goal there is really to take each small business and see do they have the, the ambition and the ability to move into export markets. And our focus in micro enterprises is those businesses that employ, employ less than 10 and less than 2 million turnover. What's really important there is we're the, we're the agency that supports most of the small business employing four and five people in our rural communities, in our towns, in our villages, which are absolutely fundamental to all our local economies. And we saw that in the last two years of COVID. They're the businesses. Thankfully that the public supported, but they were crucially important to each of our local economies. I'm just going to play a short video now, which probably is the easiest way rather than you listening to me, just give you an overview of what we do in the local enterprise office. As your local enterprise office, we're your first stop shop if you're thinking about starting, growing or pivoting a business anywhere in Ireland. Your local enterprise office is an expert hub that provides access to funding, mentoring, training, support and guidance for all types of small businesses. There are 31 Leos nationwide and we're here to help you at any stage, whether you're an entrepreneur who's looking to start a business, a new startup looking for additional support or an existing business owner looking to pivot or grow. We can also help you access other valuable supports from local authorities, Enterprise Ireland and other state agencies. Visit www.localenterprise.ie to contact your local enterprise office and find out more. Together, we can make it happen. 
No, and in terms of that, our strategic focus at the moment, and interesting enough, some of our earlier speakers touched on this, uh, very much uh, focus on developing a culture of innovation. Uh, column there reference in my own county, Eclair, the Future Mobility Campus Ireland. We see that as a vehicle that can really develop and build an ecosystem out of it. And I know from my colleagues in nearly every county around the country, we all have elements of that which we can foster a culture of innovation. Sustainability comes from two perspectives, sustainability of the business itself, that it is viable, that it actually can trade in our world, profit is good, but also sustainability in terms of climate change, in terms of the green economy, huge, um, a huge focus for business and a big challenge for business. Um, as most of you are aware, there's a lot of discussion, noise out in the media but for businesses, we deal with them one to one. What does that actually mean for them? What is important for them? And what we're beginning to see as well is particularly sub supplying from consumers. They have an expectation that a lot of businesses will have good green credentials. And in the sub supply sector, we're already seeing a focus that if most businesses have not uh, developed good sustainability practice, they run the risk of no longer being a sub-supply into that sector so hugely important. Um, Pamela and Kildare talked about digitalization. It is multi-layered, multifaceted. If you look at over the last two years, digitalization has simply accelerated. Our focus is really about digitalization within the company. So what we're looking at there, do they need to upgrade their machinery? Can they be more effective, more efficient in the production process? But equally to then, can their employees be upskilled? Can they use the new machinery? So uh, we will shortly launch a digitalization voucher, probably within the next couple of weeks, which is really going to target that sector of our small businesses. Ultimately, we're about developing their competitiveness. We've got to have competitive companies. We've got to make sure they can compete, not only in the local market, but in a global market where they can be successful. And what we're trying to do is nurture those businesses that can move into an international marketplace. Interesting enough, during COVID, we helped, I think it was about over 17,000 businesses develop an online presence during the course of what, about 18 months. And what's interesting statistic out of that is the number of them that suddenly developed an international marketplace, pure and simply because it was easy to find them online. And that was a marketplace that they didn't think they would ever be able to access. So significant benefits coming through on that side of it. Um, I'm aware that a lot of people tend to look at the local enterprise offices as a source of funding. However, we would actually see funding nearly at the latter end of what we do. Yes, we do funding, but a lot of the work we do has been around the area of training. And that's things like start your own business, digital marketing, sales, management, leadership, all the key skills that are required for a business to be successful. And what's important in our training, our training is not an academic type training, it is practical training. It's about equipping those small business owners with the skills they need to survive. But within each business, they have unique challenges and it may be specific to either the sector or the business world they're in. So we have a panel of mentors and consultants that we can put into a business and do a one-to-one. -one. One challenge a business has is they are so busy doing, it is quite often hard for them to stand outside the business and take a look at what they are doing. So that's what our mentoring consultants are aimed to do. And particularly the three I want to focus on today are lean, green, and digitalization. Digitalization referred to green, I've also referred to hugely important. Lean is probably one of the most critical supports we have at the moment because every business is challenged by supply chain costs, by inflation. Lean is a mechanism where you can look at how you run your business, what are the cost inputs in your business, and where can you make savings to offset increased costs elsewhere, ultimately about retaining your profitability. On a wider scale, we do a number of promotional activities, which is really about promoting entrepreneurship, National Enterprise Awards. This year's final will be on the 2nd of June in the Mansion House Black Tie event. Very important. That's about celebrating our, our small businesses. 
they are the backbone of all our local economies, economy, so it's important we celebrate that. Student Enterprise Programme, that's about nurturing entrepreneurship among our second level students. Ireland's best young entrepreneur is aimed at the third level institutions. We have a specific focus of women in business about encouraging female entrepreneurship. And over the last two years, we ran a very high level strategic campaign asking consumers to back local businesses and consumers reacted to that hugely positive. And then on the funding side, we do support businesses up to 50% funding with capital, be it new machinery, taking on new employees, marketing. I've mentioned about getting online, exporting, just that's an interest one. A lot, a lot of people are aware of it, but we will give a small grant for those businesses that want to test the water and export markets that might be participating in a trade show. We can offer some bit of financial support to offset that feasibility. And we're also work with Microfinance Ireland to provide loan finance where uh, a business may be challenged obtaining that elsewhere. I just I think it's important in the development of the LECPs, just be aware of what is happening in the marketplace at the moment. The number one challenge facing every single business as we speak today is access to labor and particularly access to skilled labor. Nobody can identify how the problem has occurred but it is a significant inhibitor to future growth of our local businesses. And I think some of the earlier speakers touched about upskilling. Literally, we need to continually upskill all, all labor availability in the marketplace as we move into a digital and more electronic age. Inflation, every one of you see it, you put fuel in your car, you buy it for your house, you see rising costs. That affects business as well, because what they're doing is they're absorbing increased costs. They're going to have to pass that cost on to the consumer. So it becomes a little bit of a vicious circle. We're seeing a lot of supply chain disruption. Uh, wasn't helped by that little boat getting caught in the Suez Canal. That probably was the straw of the boat that camels back. But in recent weeks, we're seeing a challenge there again, because China is starting to lock down for COVID reasons, and that's where a lot of the uh, product or raw materials come from. And digitalization is a big challenge for our businesses because that is accelerating rapidly. And then in the broader economic sense, COVID has not gone away. It still has an impact on certain sectors. Brexit, you never hear anybody talking about it, but it is still there and it is still a barrier to potential trade or it'll increase the cost of trade, particularly with the UK. And obviously everybody's well aware of the impact of Ukraine and what it's having on the world economy. So that's just a quick run through to give you a broad sense of what we do as a local enterprise office, uh, me and my colleagues around the country, uh, but also too, to give you a sense of some of the challenges that businesses are facing and where we need to encourage them because fundamentally, they are the bedrock of all our local economies. So thanks, Ali. Wow, thank you very much, Porik. I um, think we can all resonate with that. As you say, we all can sense how much these uh, local enterprises are really the backbone of, of, of our whole society and we experience it every day. So um, with that, I will move it on to our next speaker. And I am delighted to introduce John Ryan. Um, so, John, you have been in the Department of Rural and Community Development as part of the Social Enterprise Unit for the last uh, almost three years. So there what? you have a responsibility. Um, no, tell me. Is it, did I have that right? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I, I don't um, only have responsibility, but it's a team effort. It's a team. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. I thought, yeah, I thought have I got something wrong? Well, I've, it may be yeah. a team effort, but I definitely know that you're a key, a key player in it. Um, so you have responsibility for implementing the national social enterprise policy that was launched in 2019. Great. It, yeah. So uh, it will be over to you to share more about this. You're, you're the one that's going to direct us on all of this, the national policy, its implementation, and particularly how that links to the LECPs. So thanks a lot, Great. John. Thanks, Ali. As, as Ali said, I am a member of the social enterprise team of the RCD. And today I hope to give you an introduction to social enterprise the National Social Enterprise Policy, and a little of how social enterprises have figured in local economic and community plans in the past. First, I want to explain a little about what exactly social enterprises are. 
So there, social enterprises are businesses. This is very important. If you can get your head around the fact that social enterprises are businesses, it will be easier to figure out what it's all about. Here's the official definition of a social enterprise. As you will see, it's quite a broad definition. It focuses on these key elements. The first, it aims to have a social or environmental impact rather than maximizing profit. Two, it trades on an ongoing basis and any surplus or profit it generates is reinvested into achieving its objectives. And oh, sorry, three, it is governed in a fully transparent manner and is dissolved. It should transfer its asset to another organization with a similar mission. This slide is another more user-friendly definition that I've provided. It's, it's kind of more of a plain English version. Um, and it's the one that I, I usually use use um but the other one is actually the official one so i suppose the main difference is there is it, it it goes into a bit more detail about who um social enterprises help um, and you can see there the last paragraph there they frequently work to support disadvantaged groups such as long-term unemployed people with disabilities travelers etc or to address issues such as food poverty social housing or environmental matters So here are some examples of social enterprise. Mugshot is a small chain of coffee kiosks that provide employment opportunities to ex-offenders, training them to become baristas and getting them ready to rejoin the workforce. They're a really great idea. And the interesting thing is they operate in legal settings. The first Mugshot site was set up in the grounds of the forecourts. Speedpack is a social enterprise that provides commercial work experience and industry-led training to long-term unemployed people on Dublin's north side. They have provided 1,400 work experience and training opportunities to date. Bounce Back Recycling are a social enterprise that will collect old furniture and mattresses from outside your door and recycle them, diverting most away from landfill. They provide jobs, work experience, and progression opportunities to people who experience barriers to employment and they operate in the west of Ireland and the Midlands. Here's another bunch of social enterprises. I won't go into too much detail with these but feel free to look them up in your own time to see what they do. Most of these organizations are small to medium enterprises and all of them are social enterprises. So if you look there, Carebright, they operate home care in the community Aran Islands Energy are a cooperative that is providing sustainable energy solutions on the Aran Islands. Fantastic provide transport services to charities and individuals who have mobility issues. And Dunhill Eco Park operate a training centre, a community space and enterprise units. And they try to do that in an eco-friendly way. And then Food Cloud, they're operating at a different scale and they serve as an excellent example of how a social enterprise can grow. They started in Ireland, the brainchild of a couple of students who set it up as a college project, and it now operates across Ireland and Britain. They have diverted thousands of tons of food from suppliers and retailers that would have gone to landfill, and this food is put to use in charities. So what form do social enterprises take? Well, we have the work integration social enterprises, they aim to reintegrate people who have a difficult time securing employment, such as long-term unemployed, ex-offenders, people with disabilities or travelers. Enterprise development social enterprises, they operate offices um, or service offices for, for all enterprises, including social enterprises or business units, or they provide training um, to new, new or existing enterprises. Deficient demand social enterprises they provide services in areas that would be that would that, that it would be economically unviable otherwise. And environmental social enterprise that speaks for itself. Um, social cooperatives which do not distribute profits. There's quite a few that there's, there's probably you know every social enterprise is probably a, a little a little subset of, of, of a lot of these social enterprise types. Um, many can fall into two or more of these categories. Uh, bounce back recycling, uh, who, who I mentioned already, 
they're a work integration social enterprise, but they also have a, a very strong environmental side. So moving on to the, the, the policy, the Irish government's rationale for social enterprise policy was to support social enterprises to maximize its social, societal and environmental impact. Social enterprises have been operating for decades in Ireland, but there was no government policy. With the establishment of the Department of Rural and Community Development in 2017, one of the priorities first identified was to develop a policy for social enterprise. Following rigorous consultation with stakeholders, the National Social Enterprise Policy was published in July 2019. It is one of three policies published as a suite designed to support the development of social enterprises, charities and communities in Ireland. The policy is based around three objectives. Building awareness of social enterprise, growing and strengthening social enterprise and achieving better policy alignment. So building awareness of social enterprise. In consultation with our stakeholders, we developed an awareness strategy. This document allowed us to map the various targets we want to raise awareness with and some of the channels that we would be using. We also pri provide good examples of social enterprises and share them through various channels, videos on the DRCD website or case studies in our social enterprise newsletter, SE News, for example. We hold an annual social enterprise conference. This takes place on International Social Enterprise Day. That's the third Thursday in November. Last year, we held our conference in hybrid form because of COVID in the Dunhill Eco Park in County Waterford. This year, we hope to hold an in-person event. We also liaise with universities and colleges that incorporate social enterprise modules into their business programs. And with organizations such as Feroiga, who are running a social enterprise module for second level students. And then the Arise, which is the Awareness Raising Initiatives for Social Enterprise. That's a scheme that was launched at the end of last year, and it provides dormant accounts funding to social enterprises and their networks to run projects that raise awareness of social enterprise locally and nationally. And that came directly out of the awareness strategy. So then growing and strengthening social enterprise. Business supports, we have launched dormant account funded schemes that offer training and mentoring to social enterprise. Um, and, and also schemes that are that 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 that, um, that help social enterprises who are just starting up under funding and financing schemes such as the small capital grant scheme. Um, and incidentally, we are grateful that the LCDC network is administering a small capital grant scheme to social enterprises across the country on behalf of DRCD. Um, business to business and public procurement. So. DRCD supports social enterprise as they interact more with mainstream business. And we sponsor a partnering with Social Enterprise Award at the Chambers Ireland Sustainable Business Impact Awards. We are also heavily engaged in making sure social enterprises are able to compete for public contracts. We provide training and um, we're, we're working on, on a, as part of a group that is seeking to make the, the process much easier for organizations like social enterprises to take advantage of public contracts and, and, and to have a fair shout when public contracts are being awarded. So then achieving um, a better policy alignment. I won't go into too much detail here, but we promote greater understanding of an interaction with social enterprises across government. We align with national policies such as the future jobs, climate action, circular economy, social and Inclusion. Um, we ensure international engagement, including with the EU, the OECD and British Irish Council, improve data collection and impact measurement. And with the data collection, we're running a census this year. So we are very much at a disadvantage um, in that we don't know exactly how many social enterprises there are, where they are, what they're doing. And with the census that's taking place this year, uh, we will know that and we'll be in a much better position going forward. And then we also, and we, we work to enhance North South collaboration. So the cross government policy linkages there, the, the program for government, our shared future, it, 
strengthened rural e economies and communities, a strong economy supported by enterprise innovation and skills, and build on national social enterprise policy um, in terms of procurement, community benefit, etc. And then we also have the Our Rural Future, and I probably should have had a slide for that as well. But that really explains how social enterprise can really help um, develop uh, a rural community. Yeah. And then we have a, a very strong linkages with the Department of Justice. Um, this, this is the, the work to change social enterprise and employment strategy that they, they have um, implemented. And that's working very well, um, especially in the work integration social enterprises, like what, what I was ex talking about earlier with Mugshot. And I know that there are projects such as all the mattresses in, um, in Mountjoy Prison and in most of the other prisons are now recycled through a program um, that was implemented within the prison service. Um, and it's, it's, it's a social enterprise that was developed just to do that. Uh, it, it provides work experience to ex-offenders. So it's just, it, it's a great thing. It's just great. And then international policy linkages. We're heavily involved with the OECD um, and with the EU. And the OECD are actually, um, they're performing a review of the social enterprise policy as we speak. So this year they'll, they'll come out with a review of the policy in advance of um, the development of the next social enterprise policy, which is due for release sometime next year. And there we have the Toledo Declaration, a small bit of that, and that's the social and solidarity economy as a key driver for an inclusive and sustainable future. And that's very much an, an EU kind of feeling. It's, um, it's gaining, you know, the whole social enterprise movement is gaining legs in, in, in Ireland, but it has been going for a long time in, in a lot of Europe and in a lot of cases, you know, in a lot of ways, we're, we're playing catch up. So, so I'll just go through a little bit of the implementation that's gone on. Some of it I've already spoken about, capacity building, training and mentoring, small capital grants, National Social Enterprise Conference. Um, we're involved with networks such as the Higher Education of Ireland Network. Um, public procurement, as I said, we, we, we want to um, engage with, with government departments particularly, and also with local authorities, when they are designing up the, the tenders, that they make, make it accessible for social enterprise and for community organizations, that they can apply for for, for these, um, they might even, be, you know, it doesn't have to be the whole tender. It could be even a small part of the tender, um, but they should have a, an opportunity to be able to go for it. So it, 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 a lot of this would stem from maybe implementing social clauses within the tender or making it um, more advantageous for regular mainstream business to bring social um, enterprises along. And then legal form, most social enterprises in, in Ireland are companies limited by guarantee. Um, and, and as we know, most, most businesses in Ireland would be limited companies. So the, they are quite similar in ways, but really uh, the, the companies limited by guarantee, they kind of ring fence that the, the profits and or the you know can't be used for anything other than um, furthering the 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 aims of the of the social enterprise and financing. Um, we've discussed that a little bit, um, and I, I've I've said a little bit about the national social enterprise census, which will take place this year, which will put us in a very very strong position going forward, and then. You know, this is all overseen by a social enterprise policy implementation group, which uh, involves stakeholders from social enterprises and from social enterprise networks uh, um, across Ireland. So moving on then 
there is a specific mention of local authorities in the social enterprise policy. And I'll just read this out. Local authorities play a key role in leading the social, economic and cultural development of local areas. Objectives to support social enterprises are set out in many authorities, local economic and community plans, which are overseen by local community development committees. Local authorities are involved in the delivery of a range of supports to social enterprises through initiatives such as the Social Inclusion and Community Activation Program, SICAP, and the Community Enhancement Program. And by way of example, Dublin City Council, through its Economic Development Office, its partnerships, and the Dublin City Social Enterprise Committee, seeks to encourage and support sustainable and strategic social enterprise and social innovation development in the city. Supports provided include training, mentoring, awards, resources, and promotion of social enterprises. So before I finish, I'd like to go into a little bit more detail about how um, social enterprises have been mentioned in community plans in the past. So I'll start with the Kildare uh, LECP 2016 to 2021. So it mentioned social enterprise. Now, we've got to remember that this is before the policy. So um, even mentioning social enterprise, I, I would see that that was a big plus. And it recognized the community dimension and linkages with SCAI and objective 12.1 says it supports and capitalize on the employment and enterprise potential of the green economy, actively work with local enterprise office, the Leo, the EPA, SEAI, local and national business and social enterprise partners to support entrepreneurship and investment in innovation, technology and services for the development of the green economy in key sectors. So like I said, I think that's, that's a great start um, but I think we've moved on from there now, and I think um, the the LECPs should include a bit more about the, the potential for social enterprise and offer a bit more supports for social enterprise as well. So and just as a just as another example there, we have the Galway LECP 2015 to 2021. And you can see there the objective 2.1 was to develop, encourage and create an environment for innovation, enterprise and entrepreneurship, including community social enterprise. And I've included a few there of the actions um, that apply specifically to social enterprise. Um, I'll go through one or two of them. Create and support a series of innovation ecosystems in Galway City. Develop a feasibility study for enterprise creative ecosystems in Galway City. I'll let you look at those in your own time. Um, objective 3.1, deliver local and national social inclusion, community development programs to reduce poverty and alleviate disadvantage. And one of the actions there was to support the delivery of social enterprise opportunities for work within the communities. And then objective 4.4, provide, maintain, and enhance strategic infrastructure that supports economic, cultural, health, environmental, and community development. And then support the development of vacant sites in Galway City for use as allotment, social enterprise spaces, gardens and social farming and establish an education and training program to support the development of these areas. So these are all great. They're, they're all great ideas, um, but I think a lot more can be done. And I'd just like to, to, to let you know that I'm available to talk. If you need to talk to anything like this, my email address is there at the end of the, of the, uh, the presentation. If you need to give me um, or send an email to me, I'd be more than happy to, to talk you through it. And if, if you have any questions about social enterprise or if you have any ideas of how social enterprise could be progressed um, or any you know, innovative ideas that you think would be useful to, to, to be shared out, um, just, just give me a shout. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for, for the time to listen to me. Um, so I'll, I'll stop sharing now. Great. Thank you, Great. John. Thank you so much for such a clear overview of social enterprises. If we all know about local enterprises as our current society, these feel like they are the growing and future society that, that we live in. And also those examples of previous LECPs, is, I think that's going to be really helpful for everyone. So thanks so much. And yes, we'll see if we have a time for a few questions at the end. Um, and I'll just move on to our next uh, speaker. Thanks, Ali. Thank you. Um, so yes, as I said, we've got our, our next presentation. I am delighted to introduce um, Kevin Lynch. 
Um, so Kevin is Assistant Director and Senior Planner with the Southern Regional Assembly since 2018, and you have responsibility for the development and implementation of the Regional Spatial and Economic Strategy. And you can see that up, that's probably easier to read it than me to try and say it. So I know you're going to be looking at that linkage between the LECPs and this uh, said strategy, um, and particularly looking at the economic component. So uh, thanks a lot, Kevin, and over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Ali. Just checking my presentation is up there. Yeah, it's up there, clear, can be seen. Great. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do today is kind of outline the work that's gone on in the regional spatial and economic strategies, uh, with particular emphasis on the economic side and the links to the LECPs. Um, I suppose I'm giving this present, I, I work with the Southern Regional Assembly but I'm gonna speak on behalf of, of the three assemblies and uh, do my best to be fair to them as well. Um, so the structure of my presentation, I'll give a brief outline of who we are, what we do, the work we put in on the recess, on the recess itself, and then the relationship to the LECPs as they're developing and some reflections from our perspective on the process of, of, of how that might work. So firstly, in terms of who we are, probably most of you are familiar with this, but um, we were formed uh, in the last eight years, around 2015, um, uh, build, building on the, 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 the previous regional authorities. Uh, we have the three regional assemblies, uh, the Northwest, which covers Connacht, Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan. Uh, the Eastern Midlands region based around Dublin with the rest of Leinster, uh, with the exclusion of Carlow, Kilkenny and Wexford, who are part of the southern region, together with all the, um, the, the counties of Munster. I suppose that each of us is a different type of USP, a different character uh, in, in the way in our work with similar functions, obviously. Um, the, the north in more peripheral area, but with a lot of dynamism that comes from that Western approach as well, also has the, the, the border area. Similarly, in the Eastern Midlands also has the border as well, but I suppose the, big, the big, biggest characteristic there is based on the Dublin, Dublin, the impact of that, albeit it has a large rural area in the Midlands. For ourselves, I suppose in the Southern region, our defining characteristic, I suppose, is the fact that we have three of the five state cities, and that gives us that's part of our, our character, and that feeds out into the the rest of our our region, which is a variety of uh, you know uh, well-to-do agriculture land peripheral areas. So um, that that that's kind of the overview of who we are. Um, in terms of our functions, we have five main functions in in terms of our establishment order, uh, the regional economic and spatial planning. We have a key role in management of ERDF funding, uh, with the development and implementation and promotion of re regional development policies and activities. And uh, we're the national contact point for EU funded transnational programs, various uh, interreg programs. And we, we have a broader role, I suppose, in terms of coordination with uh, of local, local government on, on various initiatives. And, we, we hold, uh, you know, every year there's, there's a various uh, implementation workshops held with local authorities on, on different issues. So we've kind of a broader role there of coordination with the local authorities. So an important point, thing to point out for the LECPs and in terms of the role of the regional assemblies is we're actually very much intertwined with the local authority structure. Uh, and we, we have a key democratic mandate there in that we, we operate in, you know, in broadly the same structure in, in terms of executive and reserve functions. Uh, we each have uh, an assembly of elected members and they come from the local authority itself. Uh, that's largely proportionate to the population of each local authority, plus some additional members who, who, who are members of the European Committee of the Regions were appointed by the minister. But I think that that is a very important point in that um, our work is, is the elected representatives. And I think the fact that the way they're nominated, et cetera, 
you know, points to the, I suppose, a dynamic in the operation of the regional assemblies and that there, there is clearly a regional overview, but largely, to, to, to a large extent, many of the elected members are there representing their local authority. So in, in the southern region, we've 34 members from our 10 local authorities. EMRA have 43 from the 12 local authorities and the Northwest have 24 from their nine local authorities. We've monthly meetings with the members and our, our headquarters is in Waterford, EMRA is in Ballymun in Dublin and Northwest is in Ballahadreen. So in terms of the purpose of the recess, um, that I think that, Key point to this, the key, a key point to mention in terms of the recess is the fact the statutory nature of it. Uh, that that that's a key development from pre previous re regional strategies, and our, the aim of the recess is to prepare a long term, high level strategy for the entirety of the region. And I suppose the overarching purpose of the work we we do is the implementation of the national planning framework and to bring that down, uh, to give a, a regional interpretation of that, but also a kind of a bottom-up approach to that, uh, given, given the, the democratic mandate we have there. And interestingly as well, I think in terms of the purpose of the LECPs and, and the various strategies that are there, is the fact that there's a clear statutory linkage between the spatial planning side and the economic side. They're brought together in, in one document there. Um, another key element of the recesses is the metropolitan area strategic plans, which for the first time bring together formal plans for the metropolitan areas where there's overlapping governance. With, um, in Dublin, I think up to seven authorities, in Cork, if Cork City and County, and Lim with Limerick and Clare, with the Limerick Shannon plan, uh, the two Galways with the Galway plan, and Walford and Kilkenny. So um, that that that's a key initiative there as well. Again, just to the, the point that the recess is a reserve function, so it needed agreement of, of, of each of the three assemblies for it to happen. I think it's worthwhile as well in terms of our role with the recess and in terms of where, where the LECPs and the county development plans are where we all fit in is it, it all goes back really to the, to the Project Iron 2040 and the MPF strategy. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, good initiatives in there, but some of the key points there, I think, are always at the back of our mind, I think, uh, in influencing what we might do. A keep you know there's, there's a huge amount of uncertainty in the world and that that's 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 all part of life there's a constant change but all the best predictions are that in the next 20 years in ireland there'll be another 1 million people 50 percent of that will be by natural growth and 50 percent of that will be in migration so that on top of an, an aging population and uh a spatially diverse population, I think, sets the broad parameters of where we have to go in the next 20 years. Now, the, the key points of the MPF is the, the, the region, a change to the regional layout of the country by a 50-50 split away from the Dublin Emre region to the, the northwest and, and the south, not by restricting um, the Emre area, but by growing the other two regions. So the, the, I think that overall envelope and the change in spatial layout to the growth of our four regional cities and the growth of key towns, that spatial layout, the economic and community aspect of that is very important. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But I, I think keeping an eye on what are the core ambitions for the next 20 years for the country as set out in the MPF is, 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 is very important. In terms of the economic components of the recess, as I say, it's it's interesting and notable that the planning acts ha have both that firmed up in terms of the spatial and the economic and the bringing together planning and the economy. And uh, section 23 of the act sets that out with the, to enable the conditions for creating and sustaining uh, jobs in enhancing and augmenting regional economic performance. A key role of the recess is to identify the regional attributes that are, are there, 
terms of the quality of the environment, the quality of our cities, social community and cultural, cultural facilities. So the recesses do provide that overarching view uh, and documentation that, that, that is needed for the LECPs, I think. And uh, another key uh, task is to, uh, how to enhance regional innovation capacity. Um, as outlined by Regina and others, um, there's a formal statutory link between the LEC process and the RESIS. The LECPs are required to be consistent with the RESIS. Um, and in fact, there's, it's interestingly, there's the draft LECP have to be formally presented to the regional assembly for the elected members for their consideration of the submission that goes back to, to each local authority on the document. So that, 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 I, it's, that, that process isn't there to the same formal extent with the development plan. So that, 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 that's very interesting and, and, and I think important. Um, and the, the, development, the development plans in addition are also required to be uh, consistent with the RESIS. I, I don't say that in a, in a negative way. I, I don't think there were, I'll get to it in a minute, but I don't foresee that as an issue in the sense that I think uh, the recesses have been written in a, in a broad brush sense and in a way that allows flexibility for each LECP to develop within that framework while keeping an eye on the, the higher level regional and NPF um, attributes. It's worth mentioning as well that the existing LECPs did uh, involve incorporation of the regional element. Uh, we were at the early phase stage of the development of the recesses at the time. It was prior to them, but there was in engagement by the regional assemblies prior to this. So there's track record there to build on. Um, so in, in terms of our own recess, um, or a large part of our work over the last two years has been on the development of the city and county development plans. So we've been involved in that in terms of formal submissions, but more importantly, I think ongoing uh, discussions and engagement with them, it's part of our day-to-day -day work. And I foresee that that will be the same approach with the LE. I think in terms of the topic today of the economic side, the spatial side, uh, again, I'm, I'm a planner by background, but that, that, that's very clear cut in terms of the NPF and the, the regional assemblies in terms of targets for growth, allocation of land, et cetera. The, 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 the economic and community side is more, um, is equally as important, important but more uh, less tangible, or can be less tangible. And I suppose suffice to say in terms of the development plans, while, while the development plans didn't focus on the spatial, we were in, in terms of our submissions, we did emphasize the need for reflection on the economic side. And sometimes that 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 keeping making sure both sides, all sides of the local authority are, are aware of what each other is doing is, is something that we need to emphasize. So I think that that that's an important point to make. Um, the other point, and when I was developing this presentation, the, the, the three recesses are now there uh, quite, quite a while. Uh, Emerald's one is coming up for three years in July, and uh, the, the Northwest and ourselves were, done, were completed in January 2020. So they're, they're, they're well established and um, they're, they're, they're well, well cooked and familiar to everybody at this stage. And going back to the point about um, our democratic function, the, and I put in a slide below just to the, the, the picture of, of, of one of our public meetings, all three were, were very much developed on based on very significant con consultation with the public, with the government departments, and uh, essentially were built as co-authored with the local authorities. And, um, so, as I say, they're well cooked at this stage, and the principles, I think, um, the, the underlying principles in relation to economic development, I think, are, are stand the test of time. They have the flexibility, and they, 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 I think they do provide a good basis to, to, to be used in the LECPs. Um, 
I'll just give a quick flavor of what's in the three recesses um, in, in relation to the, their overall strategies and also in relation to the, to the economic side. Um, in terms of our own one, um, we have 11 um, strategy statements and they focus on developing a creative and innovative region, a green region and a livable region. Um, and that translates in, in terms of a very simple spatial strategy, which focuses on the development of our three cities, our 14 key towns, the development of our, our, our smaller towns and villages, our rural areas and the networks and the interactions between those. And, uh, we, three of those 11 uh, strategy statements relate to uh, developing our, our, um, the, the economic side. Now the, one of those, it's, it's interesting, I think in the interlinkage between the spatial and the economic and the social, uh, you know, we, 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 we have a statement about strengthening rural economies, building a strong economy, but we've won, which is developing an inclusive international region, building, building an outward looking international region on the global stage. So it goes back to the point about Ireland changing with an additional million people and the nature of that uh, society changing. So if we're to develop uh, our economy and our community and social side um, as an outward looking region, that we say that because that's the right thing to do in our view, but also we feel that that's what will assist um, Ireland and our, I'm speaking in terms of our resources in terms of international development. So the point I'm making here is the linkage between the spatial, the economic and the, the community. In terms of our economic strategy, um, the strong resonance between what there is, is in the three recesses and you know, what, what's been outlined by Colm and others previously. Our, our, our strategy focuses on smart specialization, clustering, place making for enterprise development, knowledge diffusion and capacity building. I'll talk about those uh, as I go through the presentation. Place making one is, is interesting. Again, that's, that's now come to the fore, I think, in terms of economic development and the IDA and others are talking about this uh, in terms of improving the quality of our towns, villages and cities as areas that people want to live and want to develop for in, in terms of economic development. And I think that's a direct link between the economic and the planning side. We kind of in planning this, we would have been arguing for this over a long period of time. I think it's good now that it's coming in from the economic development side as well. So that, that builds on that link. Um, in terms of EMRAs, again, um, that, that, that broad, if you, see that the, the central vision uh, uh, the graphic there, I think it, it resonates what, what we had in, in the Southern region in terms of three key areas of, of economic opportunity, healthy placemaking and climate action. And in terms of their economic strategies, create the right conditions and opportunities for the region to rely on sustained economic growth and employment that ensures good living standards for all. Again, um, that's very similar to us in terms of smart specialization and placemaking, building on the strengths of their region, diversity to provide resilience, promotion of regional development, and to sustain a strong economy, support the creation of quality jobs, and ensure good living standard for all. Um, in terms of Northwest, I, again, um, I think there are very similar um, parts of their strategy, but it does reflect, I suppose, the differences between the three regions and that they're the, at the core, I think their research recognizes some parts of the region's weak urban structure, and it addresses that through they have their mass for Galway City, and then they've um, essentially mini mass for regional growth centers with key priorities for strengthening the, the, the key towns within their region. Um, again, they'd resonate on what, what's in, in the other resources in terms of compact growth and the revitalization of urban areas. Again, they reference the development of smart region, the development of ready to go commercial areas as part of the strategy and development of, of the quality of life that's 
particular to, to the West uh, and North as, as part of their strategy. In terms of directly of on the economic strategy in, in the Northwest, strongly influenced by and explicitly influenced by the European Green Deal in terms of supporting investments in green technologies, sustainable solutions and new, new, new businesses. It is an emphasis on five growth ambitions set out in the strategy, again, focusing on place making and uh, on the development of a smart region. So, you know, there's common themes uh, across the three, but each focus, I think, on the strengths um, and I suppose that the ambitions for, for the three regions. In terms of, as I say, the resources are now well underway. So we're, we're well under the way ourselves in terms of implementation. A large part of that has focused on the development plan process, but in terms of economic related activities, um, uh, some of the folks of those in EMRA relate to the development of the Dublin MASP implementation group. In EMRA, the, the uh, uh, quantitative greenhouse gas indicators assessment methods, and the Northwest, the region in transition, the way forward, which focuses on uh, various indicators uh, across the, the region. And they've also done work in terms of uh, regional vacancy and dereliction, uh, which, which they've published recently. Just focusing in on the southern region, um, in terms of economic development, I think key areas of interest that I can talk to are, um, as part of our strategy to develop the smart specialization and a smart southern region, we've, we, you know, we've undertaken considerable work on this and um, we've, we've various reports and documentation that we can circulate that now bring that concept together in a regional sense and uh, we've done a lot of training with local authorities in the region in this, and we've, um, we, we will be publishing uh, our, our strategy in that regard. But I think the key point is that in terms of our work is, I suppose, as a facilitator between our 10 local authorities. So I think that's an exciting area of, of work that's developing. And similarly, um, in terms of work we've done in this area in the southern region is the development of a learning region. And that again was a kind of a bottom up approach taken from the example of Cork City and, um, and Limerick in terms of the UNESCO learning cities. Um, so we, we sought to build on that in terms of uh, making sure that Waterford also achieves that but also developing that out in a regional sense. So we'll be publishing uh, over the summer our, our, our Towards a Learning Region Action Plan, which has a, a range of, um, of proposals of how the Southern region can, can enhance in terms of the future as a learning region. I think that's very exciting in terms of how we're moving uh, away from simply spatial side to the connection between between those, I think that'll be of direct relevance to the LECPs. Just finally as well, a resource of relevance um, to the LECPs is uh, their, the publication of two year reports by the, the assemblies. EMRA's one has been done, um, our, our one will be fin finished shortly and Northwest is also in preparation. And that brings together, um, a report on where we're at in terms of the implementation of the RESIS and where we're going. And it also has a kind of formally uh, reports from each local authority and government departments. And um, I must say from our own point of view, we weren't sure what to expect with that, but we've got some very good information from government departments and also from the local authorities. And that's a resource that will be uh, useful to the LECPs. We've also undertaken joint initiatives between the three assemblies, particularly over the last two years in relation to COVID. Uh, we've undertaken the COVID regional economic analysis, uh, which you're probably familiar with, and a, 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 a joint uh, uh, with that as well, regional co-working analysis, which analyzed uh, across the region and on county basis, the potential and the, the, what's there in terms of hubs for, for the future of co-working. A really interesting piece of work that uh, will be launched in the next few months is the Regional Development Monitor, 
which provides a dashboard across uh, economic, social, community and environmental information on the development of, of each of the three regions. And I, um, that, that you, you just watch that space, I think is what I say. We, it's, not, it's not ready yet, but it's nearly there. But I think that will be a really good piece of information on a re, providing regional and in part county bases or local authority based information of, of trends that are available. Um, in terms of funding, that uh, largely goes back to our European role in terms of ERDF funding, interreg funding, um, we're, 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 we're the managing authority for ERDF, but also we also run a large range of European projects. And they give, you know, for example, when I spoke earlier about smart specialization, that, that's largely true. Our, 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 our initiative and funding for that largely came through uh, economic projects, our EU projects. I'm sorry, the, the point to make there as well, in terms of the LECPs, what we, what we bring to that, I think, is uh, also the European knowledge, uh, which, which is very useful and experience of what's happening in Europe. And just say, Kevin, we'll just need to bring it to an end just so we can move to the closing. Okay, part. just to, to, I'll finish up there. I'll just repeat the point that, uh, again, to uh, keep the focus, I think, on the MPF in terms of the next 20 years, the linkage with the recess is statutory, but more importantly, I think, uh, and we're, we're very happy. from the three assemblies so thank you very much oh great thank you so much kevin and i i just started to lose your connection just in those final moments so we na we naturally came to an end and thank you so much that's really really very rich um so what i'm going to do is actually i'll just uh take you down from the stage kevin and i, I i'm i think we're all glad that we've been recording this and we're going to have a chance to, to to connect back and follow up on everything that's been shared today so i'll take you down from the, the the online stage for a moment and my suggestion now is we were planning to potentially have another short q a if, if there had been but I'd really like us to end on time at 4.30 as well. And we have a final section, which is just to hear our closing remarks um, from On the Nibrin um, for us. So I think we should take up all of the speakers' kind invitation to contact them with follow-up questions. And if you are all willing, we'll move on to that final statement now. And if the, the second set of speakers don't mind, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just keep moving on so we can close in good time. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna say thank you so much to, to Porek Mapawi, John Ryan and Kevin Lynch in our second um, set of speaker presentations. And uh, really, as I say, a very rich full set of information, which I know is uh, exactly what we need. Um, so uh, with that, oh, and I just wanted to say one comment, uh, just reading out something from the chat, which I think it came at the time of your presentation, John, just from Paul, Paul Patton, he's had to leave now, but just uh, on the subject of social enterprises, saying that Limerick and Clare ETB is also converting horse boxes into food trucks and targeting long-term unemployed in the Kilrush um, unemployment black spot area. So just that, I think that was sparked by some of the other um, social enterprises you were sharing, John. So thanks, yeah, thanks thank, for that. Thanks, Alan. Okay, great. So with that, I will keep us moving on and um, just uh, bring you up on screen on the, if I can find you there. Oh, here we are. Yeah. Um, type that in slightly wrong. Great. Okay. So um, I'm just going to uh, introduce Anla. You are the principal officer in the local government structures and modernization section of the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. And as I said, it was it would just really welcome your comments, remarks after everything you've heard, um, just to bring us to a close today. So um, just inviting you to come off mute and over to you, Anla. Keep forgetting about mute. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to keep it very, very short. Uh, you don't want to hear me rabbiting on and repeating everything you've heard, the wonderful uh, presentations we've had. I'm actually going to start by thanking all of you for attending. I know at one point we had over 120 people listening in. Um, I am acutely aware of the pressures and being put on the local government sector, the local authorities, in terms of dealing with the massive humanitarian crisis we're facing. Um, I know you've been pulled in 27 different directions. 
And the fact that you're here today still doing the day job, I think is testament to the local government sector and the wonderful people who work there. So that's my my opening comment is thank you for being here um, doing this when I know there are so much more sort of frighteningly scary things on your desk. Um, from listening to the, the conversation, I think it's quite interesting. The local, the, the LECP, it, it, it originated in the Putting People First policy document, which at this stage is now 10 years old, but it's still relevant. I mean, we look at the, 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 the Putting People First policy was to improve the well-being and quality of life for citizens and communities by expanding the role of local government in economic and community development. And that is still valid. I mean, we even heard today about the current programme for government about adopting coherent approach to enterprise needs for every part of the country. And that, that is, to me, is kind of the same thing. It's just showing that this is still a very important uh, piece of work and a very valuable piece of work. Um, I was struck mostly by, with, with all of the different pre presentations, that the way everything is linked, interlinked, and that nothing can be developed on its own. I think to try and develop an LECP without even looking around you is, it would be very, very difficult. But there is so much there to build on, to, to, to weave in and out. Um, it struck me, first of all, when listening to, to Stuart talking about the town centre first, I was thinking of the, the LEC, the town centre first being inside the LECP, being inside the development plan. And then I began to think of Russian dolls and then I went off thinking about Ukraine again, so I stopped there. <laughs> Um, but it does strike me that these are all so, to use the Irish term, fit to foot together. Uh, I mean, we could, we, you know, we talk about collaboration, you're going to have to involve the community and the stakeholders, but this, there are a whole bunch of, some of the stakeholders were listed in, in Regina's presentation there at the beginning, but it's a whole bunch of other things. I mean, Colin mentioned this quadruple helix involving government and academia and industry and community. And um, Porik highlighted that the challenges facing the LEOs in terms of the um, the economic sort of shock the country uh, suffered during COVID, and th those experiences that LEOs have had in trying to deal with this will be invaluable to the LECP. Um, Pamela shows all about the, the whole new digital world we live in, which was accelerated and exacerbated by COVID. It's funny you, you mentioned Pamela about um, how we nearly became a cashless society. A funny story, I was at a conference in Stockholm in May 2018 and we were told then it was a cashless society, they were determined to be cash free in five years and everywhere you went you had to use your credit card and I remember thinking oh, that'll never catch on at home and here we are nowadays and you're going into the shop for a pack of chewing gum and you're paying with your card so I, I just thought you know the whole societal shift, the whole mental shift to doing everything digitally is something that can be embraced um, John, when you talk about your social enterprises, to me, that seems like a perfect balance between the, the economic and the community coming together in, in, in a lovely way where each one is treated equally. Because sometimes you think the, the economic gain is at the cost of something, whereas that seems to beautifully marry the two together and support both together. Um, and Kevin demonstrated how the LECP is part of the bigger Rhesus uh, family. In fact, they, they are almost like subsets again going back to my Russian dolls or you know into each other so that really we can't you there's a wealth of other uh, similar projects or other interlinked um, policies and plans out there in, to enable us to build the richest LECP we can um, and then the other only other comment I'll make is I think again Regina referred to things like the agility at the beginning of her presentation and the reason why we want to have a six-year vision but with these two-year snapshots that that can be improved and modified and 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 uh, sort of adapted as needs emerge and that has been I suppose no more up, uh, important than if you think about when you wrote the first ones five years 15 or 2015 2016 Brexit was probably the biggest thing we were afraid of. And since then we've dealt with Brexit, we've dealt with COVID, we've dealt with, we're dealing with this massive Ukrainian problem now and the, the whole, um, not just the, 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 the humanitarian thing, but the economic impacts as well. So if anything, we have learned the hard way how to be adaptable and flexible. And those are lessons and skill sets that we need to bring to bear on the plans. Um, 
Other than that, I have nothing more to add than just to thank you all for coming, thank the speakers. Uh, I think we could have done a whole afternoon session individually with each one of them on each topic in itself. We've only just scratched the surface and I, I, I'd love to see more opportunities to maybe explore individually with each of the, down each of those tunnels to see how we can, we can build them together into um, the LECP process. Other than that, that, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Great, thank you Anla, and just echoing your words, thank you so much to everyone who came. Thank you again to our speakers. And with that, we will close our second webinar in the series. Look forward to seeing you at the next one. Uh, feel welcome to come off mute, say goodbye, and thank you everyone, goodbye. Thank you.